happy to present tonight uh, J.B. Jackson, who is a cultural geographer from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he has made uh, his home for over 30 years. Mr. Jackson is a lecturer at Harvard, an adjunct professor at University of California at Berkeley. He was editor of Landscape Magazine for some 16 years. He has been an author of text, landscapes, American space, and uh, has produced a series of essays for a text edited by Irv Zuby called The Changing Rural Landscape, which has recently been published. I think it was out in May of this year. In last May, J.B. Jackson received an honorary Doctor of Fine Arts from the University of New Mexico. And if I may read from a small article produced, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce John Brinkerhoff Jackson in these words. A scholar of world renown, a longtime resident of La Cienega, New Mexico, John Brinkerhoff Jackson has been awarded an honorary Doctor of Fine Arts degree by the University of New Mexico. Jackson was a pioneer in the, con in the concern for the relationship between man and his environment. He has explored the special vision in many media, in university lectures of brilliance and clarity, in essays and books, and in his deliberative magazine, Landscape which he edited and published from 1952 to 1968. Through the magazine, he created a stimulating and innovative forum for the exchange of ideas. I'm very happy to produce, produce present to you tonight, <laughs> produce Mr. J.B. Jackson. Thank you very much for your introduction, and thank you for all of you for appearing on this night of all nights when it must have been difficult to leave home. Uh, I'm also appreciative of the fact that I was not introduced as a landscape architect, which very often happens. Not that I would not like to be a landscape architect, but I just don't happen to be one. And uh, my connection with landscape architecture is a little remote. My uh, interest is in the landscape, not in landscape architecture exclusively. And the landscape, as I define it, is an area which is occupied by a particular society. And in the landscape is the product of this society uh, trying to get along with itself and trying to adjust to its environment, its uh, eco-social system. Uh, I bring that out uh, simply because I'm interested in the impact of a society or of a culture on the environment and the environment on the uh, society, not very much concerned with the individual in this particular relationship. And one way in which a society establishes itself in a landscape is by building monuments, by recording its past, by celebrating its past. So my topic tonight is uh, on the necessity of ruins, uh, and I will explain why I think they're necessary. Uh, because I think it's a landscape matter, it's an architectural matter, it's a historical matter too, quite obviously. Uh, one of the contributions which the bicentennial, bicentennial year uh, made to America uh, was the revival and uh, wide circulation of the word heritage. According to the dictionary, incidentally, the Heritage Dictionary, uh, the word signifies, quote, something other than property passed down from previous generations. Uh, in this sense, it means pretty much the same thing that tradition means, uh, which is sometimes defined as the body of unwritten laws and customs inherited from the past. Uh, close quote, that's also from the Heritage Dictionary. Heritage, therefore, stands for something invisible and even uh, highly personal. Uh, is very much a matter of memory. 
Uh, what we ourselves remember and what, is rem what we are reminded of is what our heritage is. But the excitement of the bicentennial year, if you remember it, uh, gave the word a very much more tangible, not to say negotiable, uh, meaning. Uh, there's nothing wrong in redefining words. Uh, we do it all the time, and it's the way a language grows. And we're quite entitled to use a word in another sense if uh, we need it in another sense. And I think it was very evident in 1976 and also in 1977 that America wanted a word uh, to indicate the material remains of the past, not the traditions, not the heritage in this uh, intangible sense, but the material uh, past or any material reminder of the past. We need some such word. We haven't got it except ruin. So we produced this heritage dictionary, and we had dozens of heritage cookbooks, if you remember, and we had heritage decoration on coffee cans, and we sold heritage homes that cost $40,000 a piece. All of these uh, were part of the bicentennial year. And uh, of course, none of these items were inherited from the past, and uh, I doubt if any of them were intended to last very long into the future. Uh, they, were, they were mostly commercially promoted products, and uh, they've either been discarded by now or they've been given another name. Uh, I'm not presuming to criticize uh, uh, this use of the word or uh, any of the articles which were offered for sale during the bicentennial year. Uh, plenty of people have already done that, and I think the criticism has often been very unjust. Uh, what we choose to celebrate is much more important than how we celebrate it. And uh, we had uh, something to celebrate, which was uh, two centuries of independence, which was a very impressive performance. So the point of my remarks is briefly this, that I wish we had more such occasions to celebrate. In other words, I wish our celebrations were based on this particular type of event. This is the kind of monument that I think we should have. Uh, I think we all agree uh, that tradition, uh, in this dictionary sense, uh, the body of unwritten laws and customs inherited from the past, I think we all agree that that use of the word uh, has ceased to be a very powerful influence in, in American public life. Uh, uh, precedents and, and conventions uh, we find very easy to discard when they seem to be unjust or when they're inconvenient. And I don't think any of us is taught uh, to, uh, uh, to, to regulate our life by the examples of the past. I don't think that's one of the basis of our education, that the wisdom of the past should be our daily guide. Uh, but we all know, uh, either from direct contact or from reading about it, that there still are societies uh, where tradition, where that uh, heritage of unwritten laws and customs regulates all public activity, uh, everything from dress and uh, language to food and religion. Uh, I'm thinking of the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico, which is where I live, and they, they here you have a very traditional, a very uh, heritage-minded society. Uh, among the Pueblo Indians, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, uh, the public observance of uh, certain traditions, uh, certain seasonal dances and ceremonies and parades, uh, 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 have to be observed. Uh, if you were to reject any of those, if you were to forget them, or not participate in them, it would be the equivalent of rejecting the wisdom of your ancestors and you'd imperil the survival of the community. This is the point of view of the Pueblo Indians and of many other Indian groups. Uh, it's not a matter of, of sentiment or convenience or even in enjoyment. Uh, that has nothing to do with the observance of this kind of heritage. Uh, its authority is not open to discussion. Uh, and agreeing on the necessity for certain observances is the way that a society is held together, including our own. Uh, still, uh, even traditional societies like the Indians, who are very much aware of these ceremonies and these dates and occasions, uh, there's always a tendency to forget and uh, to let them slide. 
or what is even uh, more dangerous is to let them become a matter of personal choice, the way we go to church when we feel like it and stay away when we don't want to go. So in order to prevent this kind of lapse from observing things, uh, society, including our own, has devised uh, ways of jogging our collective memory. And that is what a monument is, uh, as its etymology uh, indicates. Uh, it is a reminder. That's what the word monument means. A putting us in mind of the great public figures or the great public events uh, which we have pledged ourselves to honor. Uh, so a distinction, uh, if you can uh, interpret my remarks not in terms of Pueblo Indians but in terms of, of USA, a uh, distinction which I think we shouldn't overlook in this discussion of monuments is this. A monument is, in essence, something quite different from a work of art or a public facility. In the past, in our own past, and in the past of Europe, a monument very often served a secondary uh, function as a fountain or as a church or a palace or a piece of sculpture, a piece of architecture. But a monument, uh, in addition to being a very complicated thing, can also be a very simple thing and a very ugly thing even. Uh, it can be nothing more than a rough stone uh, or a fragment of ruined wall as a Jerusalem or a tree or a cross. Those can also be monuments if society decides they are to be monuments. And so the, the sanctity of a monument uh, is not a matter of beauty or of use, or even of age. Uh, it is venerated not as a work of art or as an antique, but as a fragment, an echo from the remote past which is suddenly made actual and vivid and alive to us. And I think uh, some of you may very well be familiar with uh, the example. I think one of the most impressive modern monuments uh, that I know is the ruined church uh, which stands in the center of the busiest part of West Berlin and uh, uh, is a remainder, of course, of World War II. And it's an enormous ruin uh, and it, uh, it's without any grace, without any picturesqueness, without any beauty. Uh, but perhaps on that very account, it's a, it's a very vivid and, uh, and dramatic reminder of World War II, a monument to World War II. And it drives home a lesson to see this hideous ruin much better than if it were a work of art, I think. But I think there are monuments in this country, and I'm sure you could all think of many more, that I feel do have this capacity for reminding us of the past and of the lesson of the past, because that's what I'm talking about. And uh, one of them, I feel, is the monument uh, near the bridge at Concord in Massachusetts, which I'm sure some of you have seen. Uh, a very simple monument, almost a crude monument, but very impressive. And I think also the arch at St. Louis is another one of these monuments that I'm not speaking of their aesthetic quality, which may or may not be high. I'm speaking of their capacity to remind, uh, to recall something specific, an event in both cases. Now, along with uh, visual reminders of uh, statues, or whatever they may be, Along with these visual reminders of the past, uh, we have temporal reminders, that is to say, dates which are also uh, set aside to commemorate persons or events uh, that are important to us and that we're supposed to respect. And uh, to commemorate is the same, has the same meaning as monument, or as to, to, it, to, it means, to commemorate means to remember intensely. That's what the word means in Latin. So traditional societies uh, differ from ours, it seems to me, uh, in emphasizing uh, the didactic purpose of monuments uh, and minimizing their aesthetic or practical appeal. It doesn't matter whether they're hideous. It doesn't matter whether they're useless. They do have a lesson to teach. They have something to tell us or to remind us of. And primitive societies, and our own society up until, say, a hundred years ago, uh, didn't believe that monuments were intended to please or to make us nostalgic for the past. That's something that a monument is not supposed to do. 
It has nothing to do with sentiment. It has something to do with the moral obligation. And I think we can best understand uh, the true function or the true conventional function of, of the uh, monument by comparing it uh, to that uh, second yellow slip that the telephone company sends us when we haven't paid our bill. Uh, and our response, when you get that little yellow slip, some of you may possibly have had one, when you get that little second yellow slip, our reaction is not to admire the phraseology of the notice, and say how well expressed it is, and uh, we don't uh, sit and daydream about the pleasant long distance telephone conversations we had two or three months ago uh, when we get this thing. Uh, we reach for our checkbook, we're, f we're angry, we're ashamed, we're humiliated. We reach for our checkbook and we discharge this obligation in order to, to avoid future trouble. That's what a monument, in a sense, should do. Now, it's probably quite unnecessary to say that uh, there's no public monument, uh, no public uh, holiday which in this country has retained any of that almost sacred quality. And a uh, great many monuments have either been destroyed or they've been moved out of the way because they're inconvenient where they were. And uh, I think what we have done to the calendar in the United States is, uh, is a scandal which most Americans resent very much, uh, what we have done to our national holidays. But I think there is a movement to put them back where they belong. Uh, but when we look around at more recent monuments, uh, whether World War I or World War II or Korea, what we very often find, and I'm sure that they would, would find it here in Muncie, are a series of public installations, uh, memorial parks, memorial stadiums, memorial student unions, uh, memorial drives and highways and bridges. This is the way we are uh, thinking of monuments now. And California has a memorial redwood grove, which was planted some 2,000 years ago, to be sure. But it is a memorial grove that California has, which is, uh, and I like to think that this is a kind of, uh, this kind of convenient monument uh, is simply a matter of lapse of taste, and that, uh, and that we will get back to looking at it in the right light, and that there is still a strong sentiment among all Americans, I think, among all people, uh, traditional respect for certain religious monuments and certain religious, religious dates. I don't believe we're going to change Christmas to, uh, to make a convenient long weekend, as we've done all the others. Now, uh, the most eloquent expression of what a monument, of the classical point of view, I realize that I'm talking in very old-fashioned terms, the most eloquent expression of the classical point of view toward monuments is something which is familiar to every American, and that is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And as you perhaps remember, the ostensible reason for his uh, giving the address was to dedicate a very small graveyard where the remains of northern soldiers were to be buried. But it can be read, I think, as a very concise and very beautiful description of what a monument means and how we should respond to it in our thoughts and actions. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to recite it to you. All of you know it, but if you go through it, you'll see that it involves that we are dedicated to something by having a monument. That is what the classical monument was to be and was up until that particular time. But strangely enough, now this is where I find the, the history of the American landscape is sometimes very revealing. Uh, it was only a matter of a very few years after Lincoln gave that speech, which should have reminded people very definitely of what they were doing, uh, we begin to see signs in the USA of a new definition of monuments. And it's a definition, which I think is still current, uh, which ignores the, ex the, the individual hero uh, or, the, or the specific event and uh, emphasizes the setting of this event, or the hero's house, or whatever it may be, and the environment of the subject of the commemoration. This is what happens around about 1865. So let me, let me try to explain what I mean, because this is very definitely one of the things that does happen in the American landscape, is the total reinterpretation of the notion of monument. Uh, no sooner was the Civil War over, in other words, about 1866 or so, 
Now, then there was a widespread movement to declare that the battlefield was a monument. And I think this was something very new. It was new. Europe had not done anything like this, and the United States had not done anything like this. It was really, if one were to write the history of the American environment and of environmental awareness, interpretation, this is, this is very much of an important turning point, when a whole environment can be made a monument. Uh, so this is something novel that's happened here. Uh, an immense landscape of thousands of acres of fields and roads and farmhouses, an environment which is dotted with all sorts of instructional material, if you've been there, uh, uh, guns and cannon and, and little tablets and little maps and uh, statues all over the place. Uh, this collection of monument becomes a monument to the event which took place there. Now, I don't presume to, to, to understand this complex approach to it, but this is what happens. What we're having here is a reconstruction of the event and not a reminder of the event and the lessons that it taught. I emphasize, uh, obviously, a, a very old-fashioned point of view that the monument should teach us something, should remind us of something. That is not, evidently, the current point of view. I don't know what the current point of view is, but I'm simply trying to point out to you that there comes this shift about 100 years ago in which we say, in effect, Oh, we don't want to draw any lessons from the past. Forget that. It's very nice to know about it, but please don't expect us to change our way of living, our way of thinking on the basis of that. So you have these reconstructions that, are, that come about. And uh, we, we, we don't look to the monument or what it stands for as a guidance for the future at all. It's simply something which explains the event. It's, it's like a model. It's like a, it's like a, a movie. It's like a diorama. I don't mean to say that the Gettysburg battlefield is not a very impressive and moving thing to see, as indeed it is. I merely want to suggest that it's not a monument in the old hortatory sense. Uh, it doesn't warn us or reminds us. It imposes no obligation on us. So this is one way of approaching the past. Now, along with this new idea that, uh, that the environment can serve as a monument, uh, comes another idea, another which again, I think is specifically American. It started out in America, it's become widespread now throughout the world. And that is the monument to the anonymous figure. Bear in mind that the opposite of this is a monument to a hero, somebody that you know, and whose, whose accomplishments and prowess you recognize. Now we get somebody who is anonymous. And the first example of this anonymous hero is a very familiar one to all of us in America, and that is the Civil War Memorial uh, that we see in almost every American town. And uh, what you'll notice when you look at this, uh, it's actually a statue of an anonymous soldier. It's not the statue of a local hero. It's not the statue of a famous general. It's a statue of a Civil War GI in uniform, usually with his rifle. I think this is a remarkably appropriate kind of monument, uh, but it was new at the time. The anonymous soldier had never been recognized, and it's a, not only a democratic tribute, but it's a, it's a, it's a new way of approaching war. Uh, and it's most suitable, I think, for a war monument, a war monument, and thoroughly understandable in its simplicity and its dignity and symbolism. But it is another turning point, I think, and I'm afraid I don't think it's a very happy turning point when we begin to celebrate anonymous people. I don't know who the hell we're celebrating when you celebrate somebody that's anonymous. Because you know, before very long, America starts to turn out a whole bunch of monuments, and any of you can enumerate dozens of them, of which uh, are anonymous people who have never done anything in particular and who have nothing to their credit, really, and who identified with no place or no event. Uh, so you have this kind of a monument scattered all over the United States, and they multiply. We have the anonymous pioneer mother, uh, the anonymous cowboy, the anonymous Gloucester fisherman, uh, the anonymous newsboy. There's an anonymous baseball player somewhere. And the town of, of uh, Enterprise, Alabama, has a large statue to the anonymous boll weevil. Right in the middle of time. So during the last century, we have unconsciously rejected the traditional monument and its purpose and have devised at least two new types. 
the anonymous figure in the environment or the pseudo environment. And by pseudo environment, I mean all these memorial stadiums and memorial libraries we see in every American town. And we take them for granted. Uh, but no longer than a generation ago, uh, they, were, they were bitterly criticized. If you read any of the architectural magazines of, say, after World War I, you will find bitter criticism of this tendency to use a bridge, highway, park, as a memorial. They said they thought that was, uh, that was uh, lacking in piety. And uh, so it was. But uh, that idea has been pretty well abandoned. Now, there was an American architect by the name of Leopold Eitlitz. Some of you may have heard of him. He was uh, a good architect in his day, which was in the last years of the 19th century. And uh, he wrote very well for architectural magazines. And he wrote in an architectural magazine discussing the lack of monuments in America at that time. This was 1891. And he said this, we are busy in improving the material conditions of mankind, and I have to look upon ethical relations not so much as paramount in themselves, but as adjuncts to material well-being. The priest and the soldier no longer govern the world. They are relegated to positions of servants of the people, and the merchant, the manufacturer, the builder of railroads and ships have taken the place of kings, bishops, and generals. The majority of buildings which command the attention and services of the architect at the present time and in this country are strictly business buildings, railroad stations, insurance and office buildings, stores and new offices, and of course we build courts of justice and capitals. They represent vital social and political ideas, but these ideas have been deprived of their poetry. A judge no longer performs the functions inherent in his office in the past. He is sunk down into a referee who decides upon the cogency of contending lawyers. Hence it is a fact that a courtroom is nothing more than a convenient apartment for legal discussion, and a number of such apartments are habitually packed into a rectangular structure which can in no way be distinguished from surrounding business buildings. This is Mr. Eidlitz writing an architectural record in 1891. So, evidently, it, they were aware of very much something was happening then. I think Idlis's explanation is very good. I think we ought to, at least I ought to, try to understand the attitude that we are now expressing with these two different kinds of monument, the statue to the anonymous figure and the reconstructed or pseudo-environment. And I think it's very clear that we are most interested in our past as distinguished from our history, and that uh, we, want, uh, we want to have that past part of our daily life and part of our daily existence because it expresses, because it establishes continuity. And that, of course, is an excellent reason, as the reason for any monument is to establish this continuity. And the question in my mind is whether these contemporary monuments, these anonymous figures, and these uh, pseudo-environments do, in fact, establish any kind of a link with history. And I may say I don't think they do. Uh, the latest phase in this development of this American attitude, I shouldn't say American because I think it's probably spreading into Europe and other parts of the world, but I only know of it here. The latest phase in the development of this new American attitude toward monuments is one in which many young people, uh, especially architects and planners, and landscape architects are interested, and that is the preservation and restoration of past environments, both architectural and urban. Now, anybody who has traveled very much in the United States, and I have traveled a great deal in the United States, is aware of the remarkable work of restoration which has recently been done in the residential parts of Boston or Georgetown or San Francisco or New Orleans and other towns could be mentioned. And it's unfortunately true that some of these projects uh, have entailed a great deal of social dislocation. Uh, but in some cities, notably I think in Baltimore and in San Francisco, uh, uh, this has not been the case. In other words, there's not been so much social dislocation. Another phase of restoration, uh, which is less spectacular, but which I think perhaps is more valuable, is the recycling of old and obsolete schools, offices, factories for low-income apartments. This sort of restoration and revival uh, seems to me in the best classical tradition of a city renewing itself and of remaining a community 
with an identity even while it's growing and changing. It is historical restoration in the sense that every city has undergone it, the same process, not once but several times. I wish this were the only kind of restoration that I could refer to in this discussion of monuments, but there is another kind, and I'm afraid it's even more popular because it's more sensational. I'm thinking of those expensive and often financially very successful attempts to transform a, a whole area of a town or a city, in case, some cases a whole town, uh, into a period pseudo-environment, colonial, 1890, or pioneer, or whatever. Uh, these, pu these projects usually have the backing of a style ordinance of some sort, and of uh, historical zoning, and uh, while the basic inspiration, I think, is usually a revival of real estate values, uh, they have the promotion and the backing of, of high-minded antiquarians and of, of, of history buffs, and I'm sorry to say of many architects. So wherever we go, whether we live in Indiana or California or Texas, we find an old mill or an old school or an old depot uh, or an old village which has been carefully restored and uh, transformed and you have attendance in costume and uh, periodic shows and parades. I came through some absurd place in Pennsylvania where they had a gunfight three times a day. It was a, some little western thing. Uh, and then of course there are many gift shops that go with it, as many as the public can support. I'm thinking, I'm sorry to say, of certain communities in Brown County here in Indiana, but I'm also thinking of the Mother Lode country in California and Williamsburg in Virginia, and they're cropping up all over the place. And the West is full of these restored mining camps, army posts, waterfront markets. Uh, within a 20-mile radius of where I live in New Mexico, which is just outside of Santa Fe, there's a reconstructed Spanish-American village of the 18th century, a reconstructed Spanish-American frontier of the 19th century, a reconstructed, carefully restored architectural historic zone of the 17th century, and an Indian Pueblo which has been reconstructed in authentic prehistoric style by a Hollywood crew that wanted to use it as a setting for a Western movie. So you have all of this around, the tourists flock to them. And yet within this whole area, which has a, a very uh, exciting history of four centuries. I doubt if there are two monuments which refer to specific events or to specific persons. Now, I'm familiar, as we all are, with the justifications given for these, these pseudo-environments. Uh, uh, we say that people become interested in history after visiting them and consequently go on to study it. Uh, or else we blame them on the popularity of gun smoke and bonanza and western movies. And so that's one explanation for it. And then on a loftier plane, and I presume an academic plane, uh, we are told that uh, we now see history as a democratic process and the everyday life of working people. We don't want heroes anymore. I'm sorry, but I'm very suspicious of this kind of explanation. Uh, quite, outside, quite aside from the fact that these restorations and this remodeling is usually inspired by a desire for uh, tourist dollars or increased real estate uh, uh, revenues, which is certainly the true in the case of Santa Fe, if any of you have been to Santa Fe. Um, they serve, nine times out of ten, to destroy the vernacular culture they pretend to admire. I have seen this not merely in Santa Fe, but in other towns. A working class section uh, with its own vitality and its own ev uh, evolution uh, becomes sterilized and falsified as a neighborhood of boutiques and uh, expensive residences move in under the guise of historic preservation. I've seen architectural development brought to an abrupt halt and uh, picturesque cuteness becoming an official style. And the past in such cases is degraded by having its face lifted. Uh, some of you probably read an article which appeared in uh, The New Yorker uh, by Calvin Trilling, uh, which was entitled, Thoughts Brought On by Prolonged Exposure to Exposed Brick. <laughs> in it, he says, when old warehouses and abandoned factories all over the country started being scrubbed up into boutiques several years ago, we traveling people accepted them more or less the way they accepted holiday inns at first marveling at their presence and then grumbling that they all looked alike. 
The brick exposed in Ghirardelli Square in San Francisco tended to look like the brick exposed in Pioneer Square in Seattle, which has some similarity to the brick exposed in Old Town Chicago, or Underground Atlanta, or the River Quay in Kansas City, or Lama Square in Denver, or Gaslight Square in St. Louis. Some of the historic renovations are chic, and some of them are tacky. I walk through all of them, the ones whose buildings do evoke the history of a city, and the ones whose buildings seem to comment only on the history of American brick. And then he quotes from a writer in a Boston Underground paper as saying that he sees it, quote, as a group of middle-class sophisticates taking territory away from working people, a phenomenon he describes with a wonderful word that is apparently used by British planners, gentrification. This is what happens. I think I'd be more tolerant of this tourist-oriented restoration if it didn't try to raise funds and gain public support on the basis of its supposed historical value. And as I've said before, I do not believe that this kind of preservation has the slightest historical merit. It is the best an exercise in archaeology. Uh, its historical basis is so slight that in town after town, uh, buildings are being given landmark status simply because they are typical specimens of a style, such as 1930 Art Deco or early machine age. Some of you may be familiar with an organization, which is a very worthy organization, or the Society for Industrial Archaeology. Uh, anyhow, it's a group of people uh, uh, who are interested not only in the study and the preservation, uh, or documentation, I should say, which I think is very worthwhile, this, uh, uh, the study and the documentation, but they also want to preserve such items as old power plants, trust bridges, roundhouses, factories, God knows what all, that is related to, to the industrial life of this country. Uh, I look forward to the time when this enthusiasm collides with the, uh, that of the more conventional antiquarians, because they undoubtedly will. Now, I don't believe Muncie necessarily is in the line for this kind of thing, but there are towns in the East, which are very small, which will have a mill which has architectural merit, and there's an effort to save it. And what you might expect, but which was not foreseen, was there was great resentment on the part of the people whose parents or grandparents had worked on these factories and who didn't think of them as monuments at all. Uh, but this is where there's a total lack of social responsibility to restore and to venerate a factory in which people have been very unhappy and don't like, and yet this is imposed on a community. This is what this uh, antiquarian zeal can very often do. Uh, so my criticism of these projects is simply they do not qualify as monuments. They do not remind us of significant or worthwhile actions and persons, uh, remind us of public values. This is very old-fashioned on my part, but I cling to the idea that that's what a monument's about. Uh, I have no criticism at all of any attempt uh, to revive and improve the city or the countryside. Uh, only I think some sense of social responsibility, if not hysteric, uh, historical awareness, is in order. Uh, and uh, aesthetic characteristics are not the only ones which are to be considered. So I have a few criteria to suggest for, uh, for restoration and, and uh, preservation of architectural things. First, I, I would say that residences, places where people now live or could live, are more essential than places of business or recreation or museums. That is to say, dwellings should be restored as residences whenever possible, not as show places. Second, people should be allowed to continue to live in their communities, even when the communities are restored. In other words, a working class quarter is not to be made over into an upper class quarter. Third, restoration should never obliterate signs of the passage of time. This is the way architecture evolves, by changes and improvements and alteration, not by conscientious uh, architectural restoration. Fourth, Restoration should never destroy the original dignity of a, of a building. Uh, I don't know anything about what's being done here locally. I suspect everybody is guilty of this kind of thing. In San Francisco, there's increasing protest, those of you who know San Francisco, uh, with the tendency to paint Victorian houses amusing colors, or far out colors. And uh, this, uh, this tendency, this procedure, is occurring throughout the country, I think, to the indignation of a great many people. This is one of the things which should be stopped. Uh, fifth, uh, re 
restoration should never isolate a building uh, from its social environment, should never transform it into a work of art uh, in the midst of an active working community. And six, these restorations should be destroyed or converted into something else when they're no longer useful. They, they should have no immortality conferred upon them. And finally, let's not forget, there's another aspect of historical restoration or historical um, monument creating, and uh, that is the calendar. Uh, a series of events, of parades, of holidays, of fairs, uh, these can do more to revive community awareness and a sense of belonging to a community than a great deal of archaeology and facelifting. Uh, in closing, uh, let me put in a word for the bulldozer. Uh, I, I don't know how you feel about the bulldozer here, uh, but where I live uh, in the southwest, uh, uh, the bulldozer is honored, and uh, we're happy to pay $20 an hour for its presence. Uh, it makes new roads, and it repairs old ones. It makes dams and ditches, and it levels fields, not only for housing developments, but for raising crops. Uh, it is quite possible, and very often has happened, that the bulldozer destroys objects of value. But it is also possible that we are not taking full advantage of this destructive power. Uh, uh, part of any uh, responsible approach to the past, it seems to me, is knowing how to recognize its errors. Uh, not entirely its virtues, but its errors too. And every preservation group, I think, I should have a bulldozer subcommittee uh, designated to, uh, to mark for complete destruction some eyesore. Now, for every house or garden or patch of scenery which is lovingly preserved, uh, uh, some antisocial freeway, some disgraceful tenement or some abandoned gas station should be put on the bulldozer list. Uh, for I, must, I have to revert uh, to, the, to the moral aspects of history, of what, the, what history can teach us. Uh, it's only when we realize that we can obliterate uh, the mistakes of the past uh, that we are really free to admit their existence. And any piece of equipment that is capable of destroying the errors, not only of the past, but of the present, is likely to be in pretty constant use. Uh, let me end on a, a somewhat uh, or a biographical note, uh, the older I grow, the less uh, uh, the idea of recycling appeals, of uh, face lifting, of rejuvenation. Uh, there comes a time when obsolescence is not only inevitable, but the cause of dignity and self-respect. Uh, things and people should be allowed to grow old and to drop out of the world. Uh, the instinct to restore and to preserve is a very generous one, a very youthful one, too, and the world needs more of it, more than ever. Uh, but it will be even more valuable, I think, when it achieves maturity and recognizes the beauty and necessity of ruins. Let me show you a few slides that I have of monuments. I'm sorry, on this occasion, that I've not taken pictures of the cutesy restorations because I so dislike them. I I can't take them. <laughs> this, you know what that is, Civil War Monument. And uh, I, f I think they're interesting. From the aesthetic point of view, this is the first time that we have a statue of an anonymous figure. There has never been any in European history, and I don't think anywhere else, that, that there's been an anonymous figure. Uh, secondly, uh, there was an industry that grew up around the designing of these things. There were several firms that turned them out, and you occasionally will find a catalog of Civil War monuments. It was very interesting to find them. There was, a, there was a magazine which came out in the 70s and the 80s called the Monumental News, which was devoted to uh, how you could order monuments, tombstones, of course, in addition. But they, even in the 70s and 80s, they were still putting up these monuments so that you can actually find the names of the sculptors and the firms that turned them out. Because you go around, you'll find a great many duplications, of course. This is, uh, I think, a very good illustration of the classical monument and what it means. It's a little town in uh, New England, in Massachusetts, called Barry with the church in the background and then the monument in the foreground, uh, both on the common, uh, both uh, so obviously hortatory in nature that you don't have to comment on it. But this, I think, is what the monument's all about. 
Uh, this is again Boston. This is the monument to Paul Revere, which you may be familiar with. And this uh, mall here, uh, which is called, I can't remember, it has an Italian name for some strange reason. But this is the center of the Italian part of Boston, and it's used by older people who sit here, and by children, a very successful thing. But Paul Revere is there too, and I think they are aware of it. This is, of course, what you all know. Now, I don't know uh, what uh, a sophisticated artistic taste would say of this thing. It may be that you find it a thing of horror. I don't. I like the symbol of the gateway and what it represents. Um, but I don't undoubtedly would like something that was better, which represents the same thing. This is um, a, a little town in New Mexico and uh, called Cimarron, New Mexico. And this was... Uh, uh, Captain, well, I don't know, can't remember what his name was, but he was the man that founded the town. And so one of the local people built this statue of Captain Maxwell. It's all plaster, and it's terrible, but at least it's, uh, it is a statue of somebody that uh, stood for something, and it is respected by the people in the town. There been many efforts to tear it down on the part of the beautificationists, but they still keep the statue of Maxwell in the middle of town. Uh, this uh, you know. Now here, I don't think I have to express what this is, the house or the residence of an important heroic figure in American history. By all means, let it be restored. What I object to is, as one finds in plenty of towns, well, this is the house of the, of the Snigglefritz family. They were very rich people, and they had lots of nice furniture, and they used to entertain a lot, and uh, their house is very attractive, and why don't we restore it? and a women's club will take it over, something like that. And this is made a cause, and I don't think it should be. If the Snigglefritz family wants it as a monument, let them restore it. <laughs> this is Gettysburg. This is Gettysburg, a part of the field there. And you see the tablet there, which will explain whatever this particular battery was, which way it was aiming. And all of this is very interesting, very informative, but it doesn't drive home the point of the Civil War at all. Uh, these are, this is a terrible... This is something that the Boy Scouts of America, back in about 1919, I think, another anonymous statue, anonymous, doubly anonymous, since it's Statue of Liberty, but uh, it was given by the uh, Boy Scouts of America to communities that I presume had a certain amount, certain enrol enrollment. And so that you find the Statue of Liberty, you may find them here in Indiana, but I doubt it. These were throughout Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, a very simple little communities where I dare say they were trying to encourage Boy Scouts. And unfortunately, in this case, the head had broken off Statue of Liberty and they put it back without any net so that you could... <laughs> this, is, this, is what I, this is what I object to. This is, what, this is a kind of frivolity that I object to very much. This is the statue to the bull weevil, you see. <laughs> Now, this is something which I'm sure many of you dislike. I find it about as near to a monument as, uh, as there is a vernacular monument, and that is when this happens to be the College of Mines in New Mexico, and that's a terrific mountain that those poor freshmen or sophomores have to climb to whitewash that big M every year, and you'll find it, and uh, of course, as I say, most well-thinking people find it terrible. I like it. And uh, I like to, I, I try to get as near as I can to take these pictures out. This, it seems to me, represents monument in the truest sense of the word. And it's as best that most of our little communities can do. And it's done usually by high school kids. This, again, I find it... <laughs> this happens to be a town, you probably know it. Uh, it's in uh, western uh, Illinois. And it happens to be a town where, where Douglas was a lawyer, and I think where Lincoln practiced law. It has a, a noble American tradition. This is what they find, the pig capital or poor capital of the world. This is how low we have descended in the creation of money. <laughs> this. That uh, at least expresses a sentiment, uh, I'm sure a heartfelt sentiment. Uh, this is a, a little town in um, Louisiana that's being restored quite attractively. I'm a little suspicious of it because I think there are probably going to be boutiques in there, but it was very prettily done. 
Uh, uh, this is the way I think buildings should be treated. Uh, uh, as long as it's kept up, it should be used for whatever use it, uh, it, it can serve. I see no reason why this thing should be uh, restored and made into a, a civic monument. I think it's very suitable the way it is there. This is some little town, California. And this is the Disneyland touch, of course, that we're all familiar with. This is totally new. Uh, some shopping center outside of Los Angeles, all made over in this uh, cutesy uh, 1890 style. Uh, detestable. Uh, I think uh, when I was quoting from this thing in which it said that Ghirardelli Square was like these other things, I want to put in a good word for Ghirardelli Square, which has no period feeling at all, which does not pretend to be old San Francisco or anything. It's just an attractive place. This, I think, is thoroughly justified. What the others may be, I don't know. This is, well, this is the ruin. Uh, in a, it's in a Dutch landscape of, uh, of the 17th century, I think. And that's the time uh, when I think many of our, 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 our environmental instincts were at their best. When we, uh, we were not necessarily being romantic, but we did know what a ruin represented in the way of dignity, solemnity, and the notion of the transitoriness of human affairs and so forth and so on. Here is what the ruin serves, not as a place for a gift shop, not as, a, um, uh, as anything that's uh, for tourists, but simply as a reminder of, of history. And consequently, this is the period when, in the 17th century, when people begin to understand that the ruin is not romantic, it is not picturesque, it is a monument. And here again is another Dutch picture with the ruin in it. Now, as you all know, when you get into the 19th century, in the latter part of the 18th century, the ruin assumes a sentimental quality which I don't think is valuable, but here it, it has this monumental quality. And I think, uh, well, there's another word, and that's the ruin of Heidelberg Castle, uh, which has been kept, of course, uh, since the 17th century as a ruin. And uh, I think it has this monumental uh, function uh, that a ruin should have. That's the reason I think ruins are necessary, simply to remind us of time and of history without any particular period. All right, there's another one. That's a little town in Arizona. Arica or Arica, with their enormous A that the high school is put up on the side of the mountain. And I think that's probably the last slide. No, we, that happens to be Bunker Hill uh, in, uh, in Charleston. And I, I, this, I'm sorry to say, I'm old fashioned enough to think that this is a perfect monument. Okay, thank you. Sure, sure. Are there any uh, questions that you would like to put forth? Yes. Elaborate on the distinction between history and the past. Is that right, Dave? I'm sure that's a rhetorical question. You know the difference as well as I, and I'm not very sure of it. I would say history is a chronicle of events and people, uh, a very specific knowledge of, of what had gone on. A sense of the past uh, can be sentimental and uh, without much detail to it. I don't think that's a very good explanation, but that's the one that I see. I think Americans are very fond of the past and have a very pleasant feel for it. But I think history is more important, educationally, certainly. I see uh, so many roadside museums which don't have a date, don't have a name, don't have a place in it, but just a bunch of junk from the 19th century. People love it, and I'm very much touched by this affection for our past, but I'd like to have them know one or two dates and names. That's the distinction that I make. No, no, it doesn't. Yeah, it's up there. Uh, how do you feel about the deterioration of ruins, like the uh, air pollution destroying the Roman ruins in that past? I think it's very unfortunate. I don't know the, I don't know the extent of it. I think it's uh, very unfortunate, and I think it should be checked. I, I don't believe it uh, should affect our attitude toward that particular monument. You think should, they should be, be able to control that? The, I think they should try. 
I, I, th I think yes, I certainly do. The deterioration undoubtedly will continue, but that you're quite right. That kind of thing should be preserved as much as we can. I have no objection to preservation when there's piety back of it, to use an old-fashioned word. I simply don't like it when it's a tourist. Come on. Okay. Yes. Well, you kept the definition of monument constant and then said we're not making those anymore. Now, as a cultural geographer, if there's a, a major phenomenon to be explained, this change in monument, uh, you seem to have passed over that, saying you don't quite understand why that's occurring. Well, I don't understand. I, you're quite right. I have uh, said that the monument was one thing, and then I point there's a var variation on it. I'm sorry to say I feel that what has occurred is a deterioration in our historical consciousness and our sense of, of our own background and our own culture. I'm afraid there's no other explanation. I'm sure there's a more charitable one. I can't think of it. And I just wish we knew our history better. Yes? You say that monuments are turning from heroes and events to environmental settings. Could you further separate the setting from the event? How do you define better? Well, very often it isn't an event. I mean, like a student memorial union or memorial park, you know, all those who fell in World War II or something. So it isn't always an, a, a, a person or anything like that. It's just a group of people or perhaps it is an event in a way. But I don't, I don't think that's what parks are for and I don't think that's what they died for. I somehow think that even the simplest stone would be better than calling it a memorial. I know that there's respect back of this, but I think we've forgotten something there. Yes. Michael? I was wondering which you'd rather have, the uh, St. Louis Arch or the Cast Iron Industrial District, which was there before it? Uh, that's a, that's a, an, an important choice that I'd have to make, and since I do have to make it, I, I realize that it, I would say the arch. I'd say the arch. Uh, this, is a, this is perhaps a very narrow point of view. I think a public, political, historical event perhaps has priority over private concerns as a, as a lesson. Yes. No, uh, uh, quite, I can. I shouldn't be so now as to say that a work of art is not a monument. It obviously is in a case like Venice, and I think the whole world is responding to it this way. Uh, it doesn't come under your, uh, either of my categories, unless we think of it as a chapter in European history. Norman? I understand that um, the students of Kent State University have been objecting to this strongly to buildings being placed where several student students were killed several years ago. I presume, of course, that the building is not intended whatsoever as a model, and that they want to keep the environment absolutely as it was as a model. And the other point I'd like to make is that I suppose other than St. Louis Arms, the ultimate monument, it's an Eiffel Tower, but I wonder how many people in the world realize it's there to commemorate 100 years of the French Revolution. I don't think they do. I don't think they do. Could you repeat his question? Uh, uh, the question was, or at least the remark was, that we are not always aware of what the monument particularly what it celebrates, am I right? That the Eiffel Tower actually is a, a monument to 100 years since the French Revolution. And what was your other instance? That uh, the, the, the students who were killed at Kent, or at least the, the, the fellow students, wished to keep a piece of land there absolutely free of any kind of construction as a monument to the incident. Am I to comment on that? Yes, yeah, an interesting comment on, on the way the other people think today. That they wanted to keep it, do they want that? I thought they were perhaps going to put up a monument of some sort.